Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MSK Spotlight. My name is Thomas Tamela. I'm a, an assistant member in the Cancer Biology and Genetics Program at the Sloan Kettering Institute. Uh, for those of you who, who have uh, been with us before, welcome back. For those of you who are just joining, uh, we're, we're happy to have you. Uh, this online seminar series by the Sloan Kettering Institute features live stream lectures from today's leaders in basic and translational biomedical science. Uh, we uh, have these seminars on Mondays and Wednesdays, at least for the time being when we're going through this uh, period of uh, our response to coronavirus. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the talk. Uh, you can uh, send those questions throughout the talk. You don't need to wait until the end. Uh, you should send them to either uh, this email address that is posted here on the slide, oset at mskcc.org, or you can also use our Twitter handle, MSK Education. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we have time for at the end. Now it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker of the day, Christine Meyer. She is a member uh, of the Cancer Biology and Genetics Program at the Sloan Kettering Institute. Uh, and she has done some uh, very interesting, uh, I would say seminal work really on understanding the three prime untra untranslated regions of mRNA molecules and the, the various functions that these uh, RNA domains can have in cells. And uh, today we'll hear about uh, some of these functions. And, and the title of her talk is The Regulation of Protein Functions by Three Prime UTRs. Christine, please. Thank you, Thomas, um, for the introduction. Um, and hello, everybody. So um, I would like to talk about um, the functions of mRNAs today. And so I think you probably all know that um, mRNAs are the templates for protein synthesis because mRNAs are, so the coding region is translated into the amino acid sequence of proteins. But as you can see here, mRNAs also contain other regions in addition to the coding region. And so my lab is particularly interested in the functions of three prime UTRs for protein functions. So three prime UTRs um, can do at least two things. So they can recruit proteins to the site of translation, and then they can contribute to the generation of a local environment during translation. So here you see an mRNA that is translated by ribosomes. And so the three prime UTR is partially folded. It binds to many RNA binding proteins. These RNA binding proteins then recruit other proteins. And the RNA and the proteins together all um, form an RNA granule that basically generates a local environment during translation. And this local environment then can regulate um, protein maturation because many proteins after they have been translated are not fully functional. So they have to fold, they have to find their interaction partners. They, um, some um, are required to, um, where some require post-translation modifications that then um, influence their, um, their place of final um, location. And so basically the biological consequences of all these um, different things that happen during translation are that three prime UTRs can regulate protein localization, protein activity, and they also can um, diversify protein functions. And that's basically the summary of what I want to talk about today. So because um, the major topic is 3' UTRs, I thought I want to give you a sense of how, how large 3' UTRs actually are. So I depicted here um, typical mRNAs across different species. And you see that the, coding, the median coding, coding region length has remained quite constant during evolution. However, 3' UTR length has expanded quite tremendously. But if you look at a, at a typical human mRNA, you see that the 3' UTR basically has a very similar length like the coding region. And if you um, um, look at genes that can generate alternative 3' UTRs, which I will introduce in the next slide, you will see that their 3' UTRs are even longer, and so they can be twice, uh, the median length 
is about twice as long as the coding region. So I, what I want to say is that 3' UTRs can actually contain a lot of genetic information. So how did I get interested in all of this? Um, so in the beginning, when I started my lab, um, I wanted to study the functions of 3' UTRs. But at the time, um, the boundaries of 3' UTRs were actually not very well annotated. So um, we developed a sequen sequencing method called 3'Seq that allowed us to identify all 3' ends transcriptome wide. So what we um, get is basically we get these peaks um, at the junction between the 3' UTR and the poly A tail. And we sequenced um, many different tissues and we found that we got actually a surprising finding. So we found that about half of all human genes had more than one peak in the 3' UTR. And so because these peaks are 3' ends, this means that these genes generate alternative 3' UTRs. And they are generated by alternative cleavage and polyad annihilation. So if a proximal poly A site is used, an mRNA with a short UTR is made. If a distal poly A site is used, an mRNA with a long 3' UTR is made. And we did a lot of validation um, experiments, and we, we realized that in the vast majority of cases, the coding region is actually identical. Um, so that means a protein can be encoded from an mRNA either with a short or a long 3' UTR. So the only difference were the, the regulatory elements in 3' UTRs. And for me, this was a really surprising finding because I didn't understand why half of the human proteome would be encoded by mRNAs that differ in their 3' UTRs. And therefore we wanted to study protein functions of mRNAs that have alternative 3' UTRs. Another surprising finding that we obtained in this initial study was, is shown here. So at the time, basically everybody, so we and others, thought that the major functions of 3' UTRs is the regulation of mRNA and protein abundance. So if this were true, what we expect is um, if, we, if we look at different stages during differentiation or transformation, we expect that um, the genes that change significantly their UTR ratios would also change their mRNA abundance levels. But this is not what we, what we saw. So we basically saw that a fraction of genes only changes the 3' UTR ratios, or they change their mRNA abundance levels. But here shown in dark blue are the genes that basically change both. And this is a very um, small minority. It's basically be below 5%. And this was really puzzling. But other people also um, observed the same thing. And now, um, in the meantime, we have looked at about 120 cell types and did 50 pairwise comparisons. And we basically see this relationship in all um, pairwise comparisons. So that means um, that 3' UTR ratio changes and mRNA abundance changes are basically orth orthogonal measures of gene expression. But these 3' UTR ratio changes are not random. So basically, um, I'm, I'm plotting here um, the three, um, all the genes that change significantly their 3' UTR ratios during erythrocyte differentiation. And you can see that they change their 3' UTR ratios actually in a very coordinated manner. So at the time, often we don't, we don't know what it, what it means when there is a 3' UTR ratio change. But we know that only in about 5% of the 3' UTR ratio changes, these um, genes also change their mRNA levels. So we don't think that this is the major function. And so because um, in, in our analysis, we saw that in the vast majority of cases, 3' UTRs did not change um, protein levels. We basically looked for other functions of 3' UTRs, and this led us to discover that 3' UTRs can actually mediate protein-protein interactions. So um, our first gene that we looked at was CD47. So CD47 is a plasma membrane protein, um, and it's known as a don't eat me signal. And we were interested in CD47 because um, 
it can be extracted by, a, by an mRNA with a short or a long 3' UTR. So to study this, we um, generated GFP fusion constructs where we um, fused GFP to the coding region, and then we added either the short or the long UTR. And then we transfected these constructs into cells. And, and we already obtained a surprising finding. So when we um, transfected in CD47 with a long 3' UTR, we saw that GFP nicely localizes to the plasma membrane as expected. But in the case of the short UTR, we saw a much more even um, GFP distribution. When we then transfected these constructs into a different cell type, then we, um, we even see, um, we, we observed that the morphology of the cells changed. So in the case of CD47 LU, we saw lamellipodia formation, whereas in the case of CD47 SU, we did not see that. So lamellipodia formation is a sign of active RAC. And so then we looked, do these um, cells actually have a difference in active RAC? So um, you can see total RAC in these cells is the same, but in the cells where we transfected in CD47 LU, you see that they have much more active RAC. And so we, we were really excited about this because we think this is a really remarkable finding because remember, the coding region that we uh, of these constructs is really identical. So the protein that is made is the same. The only difference that, that um, we have in these constructs is the 3' UTR. So that means that the 3' UTR can actually regulate the function of the protein because only CD47LU, that's the protein made by the long 3' UTR isoform, is able to activate a downstream signaling pathway whereas CD47SU is not able to do that. So there is a clear functional difference. Um, and this functional difference depends on the presence of the long 3' UTR. So then um, we, of course, wondered how is this functional difference um, achieved? And so, um, as I said, the only difference is the UTR. So then we, um, we observed that there is an RNA binding protein called UR that can only bind to the long 3' UTR, but not to the short 3' UTR. UR then is able to recruit an effector protein called Z, and recruitment of Z to the site of translation is required for the interaction between Z and CD47. Here in the case of the short UTR, Z is not recruited to the site of translation, which then um, does not allow set to interact with CD47 protein. So the experimental evidence for this model here is shown here on the right-hand side. So where we did a pull-down on CD47, either um, made from the long or the short UTR. So we pulled down on this protein and asked, does endogenous set bind? And we see that set can only interact with CD47 protein made from the long UTR, and it cannot interact with CD47 protein made from the short UTR. So this shows you that um, the protein-protein interaction between set and CD47 is mediated by the long 3' UTR. So therefore, we call it a 3' UTR dependent protein-protein interaction. So then set is actually a really important trafficking factor because when we knock down set, um, total CD47 protein did not change, but surface um, expression of CD47 was decreased. So basically the interaction of set with CD47 is essential for its plasma membrane localization. So this was our very first study um, where we identified that 3' UTRs can actually um, um, regulate protein-protein interactions. But at the time, um, we were only using these um, GFP fusion constructs. And so in the meantime, of course, we were also interested in studying 3' UTR functions of genes at their endogenous loci. And so after we found that 3' UTRs can regulate protein-protein interactions, we thought this is not just a function of alternative 3' UTRs. Basically, any 3' UTR should be able to do this. So the, the next candidate that we wanted to study in detail was a gene that only makes one 3' UTR isoform. 
and we chose P53 for this. So we wanted to um, use CRISPR to delete the 3' UTR of P53 and see what are the functional consequences. But of course, we didn't want to um, delete the whole 3' UTR because the 3' UTR contains an es essential signal, which is the poly A signal. And the poly A signal is absolutely required for protein expression. So therefore, we wanted to keep RNA processing intact and we only deleted um, the, the regulatory elements in the 3' UTR upstream. So we kept around 150 nucleotides or base pairs surrounding the poly A signal. And so we did this in a cell line and um, my postdoc Sibylle Mitchka generated homozygous knockouts, uh, homozygous um, UTR deletions. And they are shown here in blue. So when we compare mRNA levels of P53 in wild type and delta UTR cells, we see no difference. We then looked at protein levels and we also see no difference between wild type and delta UTR cells. So this um, illustrates again that in many cases, three prime UTRs actually do not regulate um, mRNA or protein abundance. So on the one hand, this was exciting because um, it didn't, um, so deletion of the UTR did not do what many people would expect. On the other hand, of course, this is a little bit scary because maybe the 3' UTR doesn't do anything. And so therefore, um, we looked for a phenotype. And so these cells um, with the homozygous deletion of the 3' UTR have a little bit of a growth defect, which we can see here in this um, colony formation assay. And they also have a higher fraction of cells that goes into senescence. And we also have um, protein knockout um, cell lines. And so you can see that this difference here is, um, requires the presence of the protein. So it's P53 dependent. All right, but um, what does this all mean? So P53 is a transcription factor and it gets activated upon stress, including DNA damage. And so then it activates um, several um, downstream target genes. And so therefore we, want, we wanted to know um, in our cells that lack the 3' UTR are maybe different genes activated or what's going on. So we've performed RNA-seq in untreated cells as well as in etoposide in treated cells. And we saw that in the wild type cells, we see what we, what we, what we expected. So we see an increased um, induction of P53 target genes like P21 or DDB2 um, upon um, etoposide treatment. But then you can see here in the untreated condition, we already see quite a substantial activation of P53 target genes in the cells um, that lack the 3' UTR of P53. So that basic, so if we interpret this as um, the 3' UTR, when it's present, it prevents premature activation of P53. So not only these two target genes um, um, are affected, but basically we see a massive enrichment of known P53 target genes in, our, um, in the cells that um, show premature activation of P53. So basically our working model is right now that the 3' UTR recruits a factor that then forms an inhibitory complex with newly made P53. And this inhibitory complex makes sure that P53 does not get activated um, without, any, uh, without any stress. And of course, this factor could be an enzyme that then adds a post-translational modification to P53. And currently, we are in the process of identifying this factor. So then um, I want to show you um, another example of how we can manipulate um, three prime UTRs at the endogenous locus. And so we actually found this a little bit by chance. So we were studying um, P10 in a different project. And in this other project, we um, deleted um, a promoter proximal enhancer that is located upstream of the transcription start site. And then we um, did a northern blot to see um, how mRNA levels are affected. 
And so you can see here on this northern blot that P10 actually makes a short and a long 3' UTI isoform. But you can see also that in the enhanced the deletion um, mutants, where we have two, um, mRNA levels were actually not affected. And also the 3' UTI ratio was not affected. So there was no effect um, when we deleted this, um, this enhancer uh, in a heterozygous manner. However, when we then cultivated the cells in acidified media, we saw that there is actually a substantial 3' UTI ratio change in the wild type cells. So now um, they make much more of the short isoform at the expense of the long isoform. And this UTI ratio change is completely impaired in the enhancer deletion mutants. So that indicates that actually the presence of this enhancer is not required for overall mRNA levels of P10, but it's actually required for a three prime UTI ratio change. In parallel, we also looked at protein expression levels and you can see that actually protein levels did not change. They did not change upon cultivation in acidified media and also they did not change when there was a three prime UTI ratio change. So again, um, so what do we do with this? Um, so there's, again, several possibilities. It could be that the 3' UTI isoform ratio does not matter. It could be that these alternative 3' UTRs regulate protein localization. It also could be that these um, alternative 3' UTRs could regulate protein activity. And this could happen either through post-translation modifications or through the regulation of dimerization of P10. And because we are optimistic, we looked at protein activity. And so P10 is a well-known ph phosphatase that plays an important role in the PI3 kinase pathway. And one of the most um, widely studied readouts of um, P10 activity is phosphorylated AKT. So you can see here, um, and I actually want to explain these symbols because I thought um, I want to make your life easier because we are very um, um, used to looking at these blots. So here um, we have a 50-50 ratio change of, of short and long 3' UTR. So therefore, um, this means that there is a 50-50 ratio change, uh, a ratio of um, UTR isoforms. Here we have more of the long isoform and therefore, so the short isoform, uh, sorry, here we have more of the short isoform, and the short isoform is depicted here in the, in the dark blue. So basically, in this sample, where there is more of the short isoform, you can see that P10 activity is actually higher because it, uh, it leads to a higher dephosphorylation of AKT. Whereas in the sample where there is less of the short isoform, P10 activity is lower. So this is really exciting, but at the time we actually didn't know is the change in P10 activity due to protein localization, or is it actually due to um, a change in intrinsic enzymatic activity? And so to get at this point, um, we performed um, an ELISA that directly looks at, looks at P10 activity. So to do this, um, we um, purified, uh, we um, IP'd P10 protein, either from, cell, from, wild, uh, from control cells, and these control cells have a 50-50 ratio of short and long isoform expression. And then we also made cells where we exclusively knocked down the long 3' UTI isoform. So these cells predominantly express the short isoform. But then we basically, um, as input, we used the same amount of total protein. So basically the input in the ELISA here in the control sample contains a 50-50 um, isoform ratio and the, the LU knockdown sample mostly contains the short isoform. And then you can see that in the ELISA, we see a higher activity of P10 when more of P10 is derived from the isoform. So I think this is a very exciting result because it shows that the, it really matters if P10 protein is translated from a short or a long 3' UTI isoform because P10 translated from a short isoform has a higher activity. And so we think that the long 3' UTI isoform probably is required to add 
some post-translation modifications because, because it was already shown by others that the addition of certain post-translation post -translation modifications of P10 can abrogate its activity. And so this is something that we are looking at. Um, I wanted to say now, but now is not true. Um, so basically when we go back to the lab, Okay, so um, as summary of this part, I showed you um, that um, in both cases where we manipulated three prime UTRs at the endogenous locus, um, we found that um, the three prime UTRs did not regulate protein levels, but instead regulated protein activity. So I already mentioned that in the case of P53, we are interested in identifying the factor that is, um, that is responsible for the three prime UTR dependent um, function. And so we already um, performed a proof of principle analysis where we established an experimental pipeline to identify three prime UTR dependent protein interactors. And we did this um, for the candidate chain BRAC3 BRAC3 is also um, translated either from a short or a long 3' UTR. And so we transfected these constructs into cells grown in silic media, followed by co-IP of BRAC3 and followed by quantitative mass spec analysis. And I'm showing you here our validation shell. So here basically I'm showing you the co-IP. Um, so this is um, the protein interaction partners that bind to BRAC3 made translated from the short 3' UTR isoform. And here is BRAC3 translated from the long 3' UTR isoform. And you can say, see that there is the same amount of protein. So then we see several interaction partners um, that are 3' UTR independent because they can bind um, to the protein regardless of the 3' UTR. But then we also find um, several 3' UTR dependent interactors and they bind to BARC protein much better when BARC was um, translated from the long 3' UTI isoform. Okay, so then we, of course we, want, we wondered um, what are the 3' UTI dependent functions of BARC? And to do this, we um, generated um, several experimental systems. So my postdoc Peggy Lee she um, made BARC knockout cells. So those are B cells that lack um, BARC3 entirely. And she also made LU knockdown cells where she used SH RNAs to um, target exclusively the extended part of the long 3' UTR. So this gets rid of um, BARC protein made from the long 3' UTR isoform. Then um, we search for a phenotype where LU knockdown mimics um, BARC knockout because those are phenotypes that require the presence of BARC protein, but they basically only require um, presence of the protein that was made from the long 3' UTI isoform. And one of these phenotypes is B cell migration. So in the control cells, they um, migrated nicely, but the cells that lack um, BARC3 protein had impaired migration shown in blue here. And, but also the cells that still contained BARC SU, so BARC protein made from the short UTR, but they only lack BARC protein made from the long 3' UTR, and they are not, not able to migrate. So basically, um, the regulation of B cell migration is a 3' UTR dependent function of BARC. So this paper actually contains a lot of data. So we also identified the interaction partners that are um, responsible for this phenotype. We also identified the RNA binding proteins that mediate this phenotype. So if you're interested, please look at the paper. But I only wanna give you um, a high level summary of what we found. So we found that um, BARC can have three prime UTR independent functions and three prime UTR dependent functions. The three prime UTR independent functions were already known and they um, are um, the regulation of cell death and nf kappa b signaling. These functions are um, mediated by protein complexes and these protein complexes are regulated by protein abundance. So basically when there is a lot of BRAC3 or when there's a lot of the interaction partners, um, more of these protein complexes are made and then these functions are promoted. 
In contrast, the three prime UTR dependent functions are regulated in a very different manner. They are also uh, mediated by protein complexes, but these protein complexes um, are um, formed through three um, by three prime UTR uh, mediated protein complex formation. And so these protein complexes actually do not primarily primarily um, rely on protein abundance, but are mostly regulated by the presence of the long 3' UTR. Because we have cells that express very little of the long 3' UTR isoform. And in all these, um, and in these cells, we actually still um, see these protein complexes. So basically what I want to say is that BARC has at least has several different functions. Some functions are regulated by um, are, are three prime UTR independent functions, whereas others um, are three prime UTR dependent. So basically, we can um, say that Burke protein um, does moonlighting because some protein functions are regulated by abundance and the others are regulated by the three prime UTR ratio. And I want to point out that Burke 3 is not the only um, protein that can do this. Um, we recently performed um, a large-scale analysis that we haven't yet published, um, where we look at um, three prime UTR ratios in more than 50 cell types. And when we look at these 50 cell types, we basically can identify about a thousand candidates for proteins that are very good candidates for moonlighting. So I want to show you one example here. So this is Huntington. And each dot here is a, is a cell type. And so we can plot the expression level and we can plot the UTR ratio. So in green, you see brain cell types. And Huntington, everybody knows, has a really important function in the brain. And so in neurons, um, Huntington is much higher expressed than in astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. But Huntington is also um, ex um, expressed in the bone marrow. Um, and, and interestingly, during erythrocyte differentiation, the mRNA levels basically don't change, but what changes dramatically is the three prime UTR ratio, what is also depicted here. So this, this, leads, uh, this led us to propose that Huntington has one function, which is regulated by abundance in the brain, but has another function where it's regulated by the three prime UTR ratio. And this is important for erythrocyte differentiation. So interestingly, there is already a report that studied the function of Huntington during erythrocyte differentiation. And this was published um, 20 years ago. And they showed that, so they didn't look at three prime UTRs of course, but at least they found that the presence of Huntington is required for erythropoiesis. And so what we would like to do is to, we would like to know if um, the function of Huntington basically requires um, a change in three, in three prime UTI isoform expression. And this is something we, we, we wanna look at in the future. But basically, bottom line is, um, I, um, this shows you that 3' UTRs can really diversify protein functions because some functions are regulated by abundance in some cell types, whereas other protein functions seem to be regulated by the presence of specific 3' UTRs. And this is often um, seen um, for other cell types. And so um, I want to summarize this um, first part. So I showed you that proteins can have three prime UTR independent or three prime UTR dependent functions. A three prime UTR independent protein function is a function where um, the amino acid sequence is necessary and sufficient. However, many protein functions actually require the presence of the three prime UTR, and these function um, and three prime UTRs can um, regulate protein localization, protein activity, or can diversify protein functions. And so um, in the second half of my talk, um, I want to focus on um, the other function of 3' UTRs because we found that they can actually contribute to the generation of local environments during translation. And they can influence um, um, biochemical reactions that happen um, in these membraneless organelles.
So um, I already showed you all this. So this is um, our favorite gene, CD47, where we found that the three prime, the long three prime UTR of CD47 can change the function of CD47. So that basically means that the three prime UTR of CD47 contains genetic information for protein functions. And the next question we had was, how is this information that is stored in three prime UTRs actually transmitted to proteins? So the equivalent is, you know, the information in the coding region is translated by the ribosome into the um, amino acid sequence. So what, what would be the equivalent of, of, of the ribosome for the three prime UTR? In the case of CD47, that's actually pretty straightforward because we know about set. So set is first associated with the three prime UTR and later set binds to the protein. So basically we can reduce this really big question into a very simple question, which is how is set transferred from the three prime UTR to the protein? And at the time we hypothesized, and so we already knew that QR is really important for this but we hypothesized that there is a second RNA binding protein that is involved in set transfer. And the reason for this was because when we, when we have the long three prime UTR of CD47, we always get very nice set binding to CD47. However, if we replace the long three prime UTR with a very good UR binding site, we only got a little bit of set binding, but not as much. And therefore, we thought there might be a second RNA binding protein that cooperates with QR in set transfer. And we set out to identify this. So we actually did a screen, and I don't have time to go into this, but in the screen, we identified the protein to C11B. And, you, and we knocked it down in cells, and then you can see that this, the TIS11B is actually required for um, set binding to CD47 because when we knock it down, um, set no longer binds to CD47. So, um, knockdown of TIS11B also reduced surface expression without affecting total protein um, expression. But when we then um, did a Western blot and looked at the expression levels of all the of all the factors that are involved in CD47 surface expression, um, we didn't see any difference upon um, TIS11B knockdown. This led us to hypothesize that TIS11B may generate an environment that is necessary for set transfer. And because we wanted to see if, this, if there is an environment, we wanted to do imaging. So here I'm showing you um, immunostaining of the endogenous TIS11B. And on this um, picture here are HeLa cells. So this one HeLa cell in blue is the nucleus, in green is the ER, and in red um, is TIS11B. And you can see it forms these granular assemblies in the vicinity of the ER. We then actually looked at other cell lines and basically in every um, cell type that we looked at so far, we see these granular assemblies surrounding the nucleus. And I want to point out that these granular assemblies um, already happen um, in un, like basically under normal cultivation conditions. So they, they happen in unstressed cells and are basically present. So then we wanted to have a closer look and we turned to live cell, high cell, high cell resolution, um, high resolution imaging. And so this is one cell. In green is the ER, and in red is um, artist granules. And you can see that they form these, um, um, these a tubule-like meshwork that is very nicely intertwined with the ER. And it localizes to the rough ER, which basically is the major site of protein synthesis of the ER. So basically, I don't want to go into um, our published data, but basically what we found in the study is that um, CD47 with a long three prime UTR, so the RNA localizes to TIS granules and it's translated in the TIS granule region. The translation in this, um, in this granule environment um, is required for the protein-protein interaction between SET and CD47. So only when CD47 is translated in the TIS granule, it can actually interact with SET. And 
In contrast, CD37 with a short three prime UTR still um, um, encodes a plasma membrane protein. So it's, it's translated on the ER, but it's translated on the ER in a region that is not covered by the TIS granule. So basically here. And so this region lacks the environment. And this is the reason why SET cannot interact with CD37. And the experimental evidence was when we um, forced CD37 short to be translated in the granule, it actually can also bind to SET. So this shows you that it's the translation in a special environment that was required for the protein-protein interaction between SET and CD37. And as I said before, this protein-protein interaction then is um, necessary for surface expression of CD37. So after we found the TIS granule, um, we had many different questions, of course, and this was not even everything. So one of the major questions that we have is, what are the functions of TIS granules other than, you know, allowing set binding to CD47? And we would like to know what are all the granule-enriched mRNAs. Other questions are, we want to identify reactions that are promoted or inhibited in TIS granules. And um, we want to know how the 3D organization of TIS granules um, is actually um, regulated. And initially, I actually want, wanted to show you um, basically a few data for all of these questions, but then I basically saw that um, it's already quite late, so I need to speed up a bit. Um, okay, so I will only show you um, how the 3D organization of TIS granules is regulated. So um, compared to um, other membraneless organelles, TIS granules have this um, um, mesh-like morphology. And, oops. And um, so the most important experiment that we did in this um, part was Ray Ray basically mutated the RNA binding domain of TIS11B and the RNA binding domain mutant now makes a sphere-like granule. So this um, suggested that it's RNA that is required for the 3D organization of TIS granules. So then um, we can also basically fuse, um, so we can use the RNA binding domain and fuse it to any IDR or to several different IDRs, and one of them is FAST-TIS, and we can also basically um, get um, granules that look like TIS granules. So basically our goal was to identify what are the determinants of the RNAs that are, um, that are responsible for granule formation and we turned to an in vitro approach. So we, we purified FAST-TIS, and you can see it forms these condensates in vitro, and they are liquid-like. And then we added different RNAs. And you see that when we add CD47 or PDL1, we obtain a mesh-like um, condensate, but if we add the FAS utr or the TLR8 UTR, um, they remain sphere-like. But I wanna point out that these mesh-like condensates are not um, aggregates because when we do FRAP, you can see that there is very nice recovery of the protein. And so we found that um, network formation um, by addition of different three prime UTRs is actually an intrinsic property of the RNA and does not depend on the concentration or the length of the three prime UTR. And so, to identify what really determines if an RNA is able to form a meshwork or if it forms a sphere-like um, granule is shown here. So Vere noticed that when he folds these RNAs, so RNAs that are not able to form a network are shown on the right-hand side, they are more red, and RNAs that are not able to form, that, that are easy, um, sorry, so, the RNAs that do not form a network are shown here, and RNAs that form a network are shown on the left-hand side. So RNAs that do not form networks um, have, um, are more red, which means that they have a strong um, local structure because they have a high base pairing probability. Whereas these RNAs here, they have large unstructured regions. I actually have to skip some things because somehow um, it's already quite late. Um, I'm sorry about that. 
but I really wanna wanna show you um, what we found. Okay, so um, we wondered um, how do these RNAs that actually can so how do these unstructured RNAs form meshworks, and how do these structured RNAs form spheres? And basically, we hypothesized that the structured RNAs do a lot of um, intramolecular RNA-RNA interactions, whereas the unstructured RNAs um, predominantly form intermolecular RNA-RNA interactions. And we wanted to um, prove that. All right, so we took two structured RNAs that are not able to form a network, and then we added dimerization elements at the five prime and three prime ends in order for them to form a really extensive um, mesh bar. And this actually works. And when we added um, these um, RNAs, where, where we added the dimerization elements to our fastest protein, you can see that they form a really nice network, whereas the, the structured RNAs only form um, sphere-like granules. So this really shows you that it's the extensive RNA-RNA interactions that are responsible for the network formation. So what is the advantage of having large unstructured regions in three prime UTRs? So we currently think that um, these RNA-RNA interactions that occur in TIS granules might promote um, the formation of protein complexes because the RNAs might, because the, the, the three prime UTRs can physically interact and bring the translating ribosomes together. The other function of having large unstructured regions in three prime UTRs is that we think that these are typical for RNAs that can actually act as chaperones, and this might suppress protein aggregation. And we have um, more evidence for that. So we are currently looking at how TIS granules can suppress protein aggregation and how granules can promote protein complex formation. And this is my very last slide where I want to show you that TIS granules are not the only cytoplasmic granule network in cells. We recently actually found another granule network that is formed by a different RNA binding protein. And we think that the motifs in the three prime UTRs, they can determine what RNA is localized to one granule network or the other. And then this allows their translation in specific environments and the translation in these specific environments um, then might influence protein functions. And that's basically what we're working on right now. And with this, I wanna thank the people who did the work. I wanna especially thank Weire, Weire Ma. He discovered um, TIS granules. I also wanna thank Sibylle Mitschka. She works on P53, Buki Kwan and Peggy um, Lee. They work on P10 and Peggy, Peggy also worked on BARP. Ellen, um, who purified his granules, and Xu Zhen, who found the new granule. And Murf and Gang, my computational guys, who did the large scale UTR analysis, and Gang basically helps with nearly every project. And I want to thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thanks very much for a really fantastic thanks. talk, Christine. Uh, we have a lot of questions, but um, I'd like to start with one. Uh, related to your P10 story where you delete this enhancer, uh, you did not really talk about the, the rationale behind deleting that enhancer. That would be interesting to know how you think those enhancers eventually lead to uh, sort of mechanistically to uh, expression of these different length UTRs. Is there some, does the, does the uh, choice of polyadenylation site occur uh, co-transcriptionally uh, uh, then? And, and how, how, does, how do you think that machinery is, is set up? Yeah, that's a really good question. So that was actually really how we found it. So we were interested in how alternative UTR ratios are regulated. And many people have found these global shifts um, so that like in brain, there is more of the long UTRs. However, we often see um, UTR ratios are very cell type and gene specific. And we wondered what are other layers of regulation that allow gene specific regulation of UTR ratios. 
And we hypothesized that basically promoters or enhancers could regulate this. And we did a screen where we found that it's not the promoter that can regulate it, but it's actually different enhancers that influence poly A site usage. And so um, this is basically another story that I haven't presented, but in within that project, we deleted the endogenous enhancer. And then we basically saw that um, endogenous P10 also changes the UTR. So we really think that in addition to polyadenylation factors, also enhancers um, do not just regulate overall mRNA abundance levels, but they actually really regulate three prime UTR ratios. Hmm. Cool. There's actually a related question from uh, Twitter actually. Uh, asking about whether the three prime UTRs themselves contain any gene uh, regulatory elements like uh, repressive or um, enhancer elements. Enhanced, repressive for transcription or for translation or? Tran tran I think this question is about uh, reg regulation of gene expression itself, so transcription. I mean, transcription. I mean, the most famous function of 3' UTRs is basically to induce MR, you know, mRNA destabilization and therefore to reduce mRNA expression levels. And this is really true for cytokines a lot, but we most of the time don't study cytokines, and but we look at transcription factors, kinases, transport factors, and in those UTRs, we don't see a lot of influence on, on mRNA stability or protein amounts. And that's what I showed. But I want to point out that there are examples and really convincing examples where 3' UTRs really regulate mRNA stability. If 3' UTRs also regulate transcription, I mean, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh uh, another point that uh, uh, one of the audience members makes here is, is about all of these experiments in the literature uh, uh, using uh, cDNA overexpression libraries that typically don't contain their endogenous 3' UTRs. What are your thoughts on, on those experiments? And, and then also, uh, and I think I, I know what you're going to say here, <laughs> but, but, but also uh, a follow-up question from the same person uh, is, to ask if there are databases available where one could um, mine these different functions of the UTRs and whether, you, okay. whether you're making such databases? Yeah, no, that's um, good questions. Um, so, of course, I, so there was like this nature paper that found these binary um, protein, uh, you know, this interaction network. And of course, they only use the prote uh, the Orpheum. And that's very disappointing for me. Of course, they still find a lot of things because as we showed for Bark, many functions of the protein are UTR independent, you know, so therefore it's still valid, but you basically ignore everything else. And so, um, unfortunately, for the most part, we really don't know what a UTR ratio change can do. Nearly every candidate that we have looked at really um, uses the UTR to regulate some aspect of its function uh, of the protein function. But currently we don't have great tools to do this on a large scale. We are planning on doing a screen where we want to knock down a lot of the long three prime UTI isoforms and just see what happens. But there is no database for protein functions regulated by three prime UTRs. So we basically are trying, you know, one by one and see what we can learn. And so, but what I wish for is that many other people would study 3' UTR dependent protein functions, and then we can basically all contribute to this and see what's going on. That sounds like a very important area for sure. Um, an, another question in, in this space has to do with uh, this biology in vivo, what's known and um, have, you, have you guys thought about expanding to in vivo experiments? You know, we call in vivo cell lines. Um, we actually, for the P53, we actually deleted the 3' UTR also in mice. But as you know, I'm not a real mouse lab. And so we are currently mostly focusing on the molecular um, level. But we think like, you know, you know, a cell 
is is a living thing. And so we are not doing any like real organism studies, but also um, I think it would be great if other people would do this. I think there are some fly people who have, um, you know, deleted UTRs in the uh, in flies and and have seen phenotypes. So another area of several questions is is this uh, work on p53 and p10 and particularly how that relates to cancer biology. Uh, and so there's a two part question here. Uh, the localization of P10 is important for its function. How do you explain the increased activity of P10? And then uh, do you see differences in the P10 3' UTR ratios in cancers? Uh, okay, so second part, we actually haven't looked. Um, this is another problem, actually, because you cannot really identify properly 3' UTR ratios using RNA-seq data. So you either need um, 3' seq data or we are right now um, analyzing single cell RNA-seq. And I think um, in the future, we can actually use that. Um, so that's basically a real problem. If we could do that on a, like with published um, data, then, of course, we could look at UTR ratio changes in any condition. But that's also some a little bit of a bottleneck right now. And um, so we actually, what I didn't show is that the UTR actually regulates um, P10 localization a bit. So the long isoform um, goes more to the, to the nucleus, but it's, it's only a partial effect. And um, as I said in my talk, we think, that, but we don't have evidence. So we are still in the middle of doing this. Um, we think that the, the long UTR recruits an enzyme that adds some post-translational modifications to the protein and inactivates it, and, and at least in the cytoplasm. And so this might contribute to the lower activity of P10 when it was translated from the long 3' UTR isoform. Got it. Um, there's a question about microRNA and risk complexes uh, in relation to this. So the question is, could mRNA risk complexes be involved on translation and loca localization by competing with some of the RNA binding proteins that were mentioned in addition to protein levels? Oh, yeah. I mean, so many people have asked me about microRNAs because, you know, microRNAs often only have like very small effects. And so you could, of course, imagine that microRNA loaded in into risk is basically like an RNA binding protein that can change um, its motif. Um, we have never really looked at that, but I think it would be great to address. Yeah, but we don't have any data. Of course, I can imagine that this would happen, but we haven't done it. A question about the membraneless organelles. Um, are there RNA helicases that selectively disrupt the intermolecular RNA interactions of the granule complex and thereby control its function? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, we don't know, um, but TIS granules are always present. And so they always have this mesh-like morphology in cells. Um, so I don't think that they are really disrupted, but I don't know what happens. I mean, you know, we only see this at the cell biology level where we see a whole cell. But basically during translation, there might be a lot of remodeling going on that we can't see by just looking at cells from a distance. And so it's a good question, but we really have no insight here. Okay. There really are quite a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly a very <laughs> inspiring talk. Uh, and so there, yeah, so this question is, is interesting. So, and I actually thought of something related, so I'll ask it now. This will be my cue to ask it. So you, you showed very interestingly that in that th the length of UTRs, three prime UTRs increased with uh, evolution, during evolution. And uh, whereas the coding sequence stayed the same. So do you have any thoughts on why that happened? Is it, you know, why, why you know, um, what are the, what is the evolutionary 
uh, benefit basis for that. The benefit. No, I mean, is. yeah, no. Look, I mean, I think it's quite obvious because you know, um, in higher organisms, you need much more regulation, and part of this is done by three prime UTRs because they are part of every mRNA, and they are basically at the right place. So where a protein is translated. Now they can basically, you know, provide lots of different information in addition to the amino acid sequence. And I think this is basically, if I would do evolution, this is how I would do it, because I would just pack a lot of additional information into the end that does not affect um, the protein folding. I mean, we think it actually regulates protein folding, but it, so if you want to change the amino acid sequence to evolve a new function, that's actually really difficult because, um, you know, you always need to make sure that the protein folds correctly. But if you add it to the three prime UTR, then it can act in trans during translation and still change what happens to the protein and you can diversify the protein function. So I actually really think that this is, um, what what three prime UTRs do, but you know, time will tell. Sure. <laughs> uh, one last question related to uh, this a little bit, at least. So, uh, is there a correlation between the um, uh, these genes that have alternative three three prime UTR usage and disease in general? Okay, I mean, um, so the genes that have alternative UTRs are basically regulatory factors. It's transcription factors, ubiquitin enzymes, kinases, protein transport factors, and those are, of course, course um, highly regulated themselves. But I don't think you can do this like in a general manner because I, what, what, what I tried to br bring across is that every UTR has a different effect on a protein because it's connected to the protein sequence. You know, it's not just that you can add any UTR to something. There's always this interplay be between, so something is recruited by the UTR, but it has to interact with the, with the protein. So it's not just any UTR function. So I really think it's very protein specific. So therefore, I'm not sure if there are these general things. I mean, people have shown in glioblastoma that there is um, shorter three prime UTRs generally, like for like 1,500 genes, but it's unclear what that means, right? I mean, nobody knows what it means if 1,500 mRNAs all of a sudden have shorter UTRs. We don't know. All right. So there's a lot, uh, lots of stuff to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Christine, uh, I think I speak for all the audience. Uh, thank you for a fantastic seminar and, and for this great discussion. It was really, really inspiring. Uh, we're all giving you an applause at home <laughs> now. And uh, uh, I, I want to just remind everyone that our seminar series continues. It will be happening uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, and you can find our schedule online. Uh, we're, we're always on at 4.30 uh, US Eastern time. And our next seminar is going to be next Monday. And our speaker will then will be Donna Pear from our computational biology program. So please uh, join us. And again, we hope to see you again. Thanks everyone and take care.